feel like this is gonna fall off. This is down for the next one. Okay, so I'm going down the whole time. Great, thank you, Maxine. Um, what's in a name? You know, Child in Nature, Forest in Nature School. I just wrote a blog post a couple of weeks ago called What's in a Name, so it's all good. Um, thank you so much for the organizers, for Marwan. We had um, several beers and lots of conversations over the last couple of weeks um, uh, around this topic of wonder, and it was a really beautiful opportunity to think um, about my work and to think about the world from, from that perspective. So thank you very much to everyone who makes today happen. Um, I wanted to do a quick shout out before I die. Oh, I've lost this and maybe, yeah, great. I need this and not this, uh, both. Okay, good to know. Um, so a quick shout out before I dive in, I wanted to acknowledge um, a couple of people in the room, Jojo in the back. Jojo was a, a play worker. He worked with us last year um, in a project at, at Ottawa Community Housing. Um, and it's Jojo and all of the educators um, that I've had the opportunity to work with um, who have really taught me um, and, and shown me what this work is all about. So hi, Jojo. I also wanted to acknowledge there are a few children who have gone and parents who have gone to the Ottawa Forest and Nature School over the last six years, Emmett, is in the back and he's going to be embarrassed. Oh, he's waving his hand. He's not embarrassed at all. Hi, Emmett. <laughs> and Hazel and Emery. And I hope I'm not missing any other children. There are other children in the room that I don't know. Um, and again, they have been my greatest teachers. Um, more on Hazel and Emery to come, but thanks, Emmett, for being here. Um, before we dive in, I'm going to ask a, a quick question and, a, and um, in an attempt of, of rooting you all um, in this work and rooting you in your own childhood experiences, um, if we can take maybe one minute, feel free to close your eyes or not, it's up to you. Um, and, and I'm gonna ask if you can remember, and for some of you this is gonna be like going back maybe a few decades for others more recent, but can you remember your most memorable play experience? I'm not going to say any more than that, but take a minute and think a little bit about your most memorable play experience. A couple of prompts. What did it smell like? Was there moss, pine needles, soil, earth, sun, water? <clears throat> Who was with you? Were you by yourself? with a sibling, with friends. And lastly, think about what you were doing. Were you moving your body? Were you sitting still? Were you playing with a ball? So once you've really grounded yourself in that, I'd love to hear some examples if anyone wants to share, just popcorn style, shout them out. Um, what, what did you remember? Anyone? Emmett, this shouldn't be too hard for you. It's like, you're in it right now. <laughs> Emery. <laughs> Camping. Camping, great. Climbing a tree. Climbing a tree. Thank you. Building forts. Building forts. Playground. At the playground. Swinging on a swing and swinging really high. <laughs> so high. I bet you felt like <laughs> you thought you were going to fall off. Yeah. Testing the limits, yeah? Oh, pretend fashion shows, absolutely. <laughs> Any other stories? Acrobatic yoga, amazing. Climbing trees, you like climbing trees, thank you. Those are my new twin friends over there. And I'm a twin, so immediately I'm like, I love you. <laughs> Great, thank you so much for sharing those. Um, so, so the question, a couple of questions that we'll, we'll start off and maybe inquiries for this talk. Um, uh, during that play, were you in a state of wonder? Any thoughts? And I'm being very deliberate about a state of wonder. The next question, are we creating those same experiences for children today? Any thoughts? something to think about as I 
go through the presentation. This is a very big picture of my face. <laughs> I have seen this picture too much this week. <laughs> All right. Uh, okay, so that is my twin, my twin sister, my brother wearing a Michael Jackson t-shirt, and my mom, my little sister is in her belly. Um, so this talk is, is about wonder, and, and when I read um, uh, the Creative Mornings uh, description of wonder, it was really beautiful. One of the things that popped out for me was that um, uh, it's, it's about making space for the unexpected, um, and, and a space for curiosity as well. Um, which, you know, that space, that curiosity is what feeds our creativity um, and it's certainly what feeds my work um, and I'll share some of those stories today. Um, this talk will be about how my work in forest and nature school um, and, and essentially how nature, time spent in nature and how play um, itself uh, fosters those things. Oh, I'm going to go back for a sec. So why do I do this work? Um, and, and I kind of, uh, what I first put down and what Marwan and I talked about is how I came to this work. And, and I actually reframed that. How did this work come to me? Um, like many of you, and, and like you described, I grew up playing in the woods in Newfoundland. I'm a Newfoundlander. Don't ask where my accent went. Um, it comes back when I go home or if I drink rum. Um, <laughs> but uh, in, in a nutshell, I grew up uh, for sure for the first eight years of my life um, in a small outport community um, and, you know, mostly like popping sap bubbles. Excuse me for a sec. I drink a lot of water when I speak. There are kisses happening up here, just so you know. Um, hi, do I get a kiss to you? Um, so, yeah, I grew up um, popping sap bubbles with my twin. We had a lot of freedom to roam. Um, to explore. We were in a really small town. We also, anyone familiar with um, jumping ice pans? Anyone here from the East Coast who jumped ice pans? No one. Do you know what it is? Anyone know what it is? Yeah? Do you want to share with everyone? Jumping ice pans? Anyone? Essentially, ice pans are float from down uh, from the Arctic and, uh, um, and they're like flows or pans of ice uh, that come on the ocean and we as kids would jump from pan to pan to pan. It's very dangerous and it was <laughs> our, our most favorite thing to do. <laughs> so uh, th this, is, this is a picture of my twin and, and we, we spent a lot of time together outside. Um, and around age eight, um, we ended up moving to the city um, and due to all kinds of different circumstances, um, I, I kind of describe it at age eight as I went through a period of displacement. Um, so I moved into community housing in the big city of St. John's, if anyone's visited St. John's before. Um, it felt like yeah, a massive city to my eight-year-old self. <laughs> Um, and, you know, and, and, and what ended up um, happening from age eight on is, you know, life wasn't necessarily easy and I didn't have a lot of opportunities to play, didn't have a lot of natural spaces, definitely didn't have ice pans to hop. Um, and it's both of those things that has um, brought me to this work. Uh, it's both the, the, my experiences and memories playing, but also losing play. And I, I think that's important to note that not everyone had really beautiful, memorable experiences as children. And sometimes what brings us to this work is a desire to reclaim that or find that again. What also brought me to this work, my daughter Hazel is going to be embarrassed that this is up here. This is Hazel. Um, uh, when Hazel was born, um, I had worked in the early years um, prior to her birth. Um, and I really wanted something different for her. I wanted to make sure that um, I was creating a life for her that was filled with wonder um, and, and filled with opportunities to explore in Rome. Um, I also got into this work because I didn't know how to do that. <laughs> because as a, as a parent and eventually as a single parent, I didn't know how to bring that into my children's lives on my own. Um, so it was that curiosity of like, how do I actually support that connection? Um, and that sense of wonder um, that, that brought me to this work and, and Hazel has been a big inspiration. And I can't mention Hazel without mentioning Emery. This is Emery, um, <laughs> many years ago now. Um, Emery is the best at finding salamanders in our forest. Um, so I'm gonna acknowledge his skills. All right, so forest school, what is forest school? Anyone in the crowd? 
Emmett, uh, I, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if, if you wanted to describe Forest School, now is an opportunity, how would you describe Forest School? There we go, Forest School, thank you, awesome. It, it can be that simple, actually. <laughs> it really is that simple, it's a forest school, it's a forest. Um, it's actually not always a forest. So um, the definition of forest school, uh, it, it, it's a term that was first used in, in Denmark in the 1950s, um, but arguably indigenous peoples in Canada and internationally have been learning and living off of the land for millennia. Um, this term is new, um, but, but the concept isn't. Um, and it's, it, it can be as simple as we make it. Uh, we define forest and nature school as um, an, an opportunity to build a relationship with the land. So we're not necessarily interested in, um, it, or it's not just about bringing children into the environment or teaching about the environment, it's about building and fostering a relationship through play. Um, and children learn in, in a forest school um, by going back to the same natural space over a regular um, overtime and on a regular and repeated basis. And it's the going back, the continuously going back, um, that fosters that relationship building and deepens the learning. Um, children also learn and, and educators teach through a process of inquiry and that, that's really connected to a sense of wonder. So inquiry, um, basically we, uh, in, in forest school, I'll give a typical day, children will come, um, they will have lots of freedom to start exploring, playing. Um, it might be, look like a group of children doing one activity and lots of children doing solo um, activities that are not being led by the adults. The adults very much uh, take a few steps back and observe children as they play. And then throughout the day, interests emerge. Um, some children may, be, may develop a really elaborate game. Other children may um, be really curious about salamanders or they may find a salamander and that will lead us on a process of inquiry that might last a day, it may last a week. Some of the prompts that we use um, for the inquiry process, and, and it's related to this topic, so I'm going to share it. Um, the, the, three, uh, uh, the three sayings that we use with children, I notice, I wonder, and this reminds me of. Um, so those are three prompts that, uh, that you can use. I notice that the stick that you're holding is super long. Where did you find that? I wonder who was eating that stick, or I wonder how long that stick was sitting in the forest. This reminds me of a time when I was your age and I found a stick, and do you know what I did with it? I carried it to the stream and I built a bridge. What are you gonna do with it? So those are examples of some of the language that we use um, as educators in, in that inquiry process. So what forest school isn't? I think this is an important piece. Um, it's not about the adults leading um, children or leading an activity. The word activity is often used in schools and preschools and early year centers. It's not about activities at all, it's about experiences. So the role of the educator will shift. Um, there's lots of curriculum connections that happen. So forest school happens in the early years as well as uh, you know, grade one, two, three. Um, there are tons of forest school initiatives throughout the city. We have a partnership with OCDSB and they're doing amazing work. But it doesn't start with the curriculum, it starts with play. Um, and, then, and then we look at the curriculum after. So there's lots of backwards lesson planning that, that happens. All right, so here I'm gonna, I'm gonna share some of the stories that I've learned about forest school um, in, in my journeys. I'm gonna stay back here because I have some notes. Um, so some of the lessons that we've learned that really supports um, deep learning and that relationship building, and I would argue that supports that sense of, of wonder um, in, in, in forest school, and I'm gonna argue in life. Um, the first thing that we have really identified is that children and, and we all uh, need freedom. And, and by freedom, I mean many, many things, but I also mean space and time. So at Forest School, um, we, we have a saying, our staff, we don't necessarily say this to children, but it's a guiding principle um, of our work. 
and the saying, this is, uh, that's my hair, uh, this is a group of educators we worked with in Ottawa a few years ago, um, but the saying that we use is, uh, we need a, a safe home and places to roam. So we as a society have really focused on a safe home or a safe classroom, but children and, and adults also need places to roam. Um, and we're trying to strike that, that balance. So freedom um, is, is a very big theme of our work. Um, I'll give an example. When we have uh, school groups from the Ottawa Carleton District School Board come onto our site, this is, uh, this is a picture from, from uh, OCDSB, Ottawa Carleton District School Board, a couple of years ago. Um, when children come down um, the forest path, we have a, a stick laying on the ground, um, and this will illustrate freedom. Uh, that stick we call the magic line, um, and we ask the children, we invite them to come down and to meet us at the magic line. And when they come down, usually one, sometimes two educators are waiting there, there's a fire going in the back. Um, and we start the conversation with those children and we say, do you know at forest school you can climb trees? Do you know that you're allowed to hold sticks? Do you know you're allowed to get wet, dirty, muddy? You can play, you can play by yourself, you can play with friends, you can do all of these things. And they're drooling. <laughs> Literally drooling, like jaw dropped and drooling. Because children so often, especially within an education context, are told all of the things they're not allowed to do. We often start off like when, when you start a new job, when you go to school for the first day, when you go to forest school, when we enter into like, you know, swimming or camp, we start our, our time together, our, our time getting to know each other, we start off by telling people what they're not allowed to do. Let's start with the rules, let's start with the policies, <laughs> um, and then eventually we'll get to the good stuff, you know? Um, and relationships, you know, relationships don't really happen at school, relationships don't really happen at work. Um, and so what we're trying to do is like flip that on, on its head. Um, and, and what we're trying to do is set a tone that freedom, that children are going to find freedom in this place. Freedom to think, freedom to explore, freedom to create. Um, and that's, that's a really big driving force of our work. Um, another thing that, uh, uh, that will illustrate this concept of, of freedom, um, when children come, and this is our OCDSB groups, but also our family programs that Emmett and, and Emery are, are a part of, um, when children come in the morning, we usually sit down, we, we have a fire often, um, and, and if not a fire, a circle, and we'll ask the children, where would you like to go today? You know, what, what happened last week? Where might you want to take that? Where on the property would you like to explore? And they have this like little democracy and they vote and you know, they make a case for where they want to explore. Um, but it's not the adults making that decision and, and that's another really important piece. Um, one of our educators, Sonia, a couple of years ago, I was walking down the path and I overheard her with a group of children and, and educators and parents because it was a school group. And she said, we have somewhere we have to be, but we're in no rush to get there. And I really love that concept. All right. Another concept and, and maybe lesson or theme in our work is around risk and trust. And maybe I should put trust and then risk <laughs> um, instead uh, in, in order. Um, so in, you know, nature itself offers children uh, risks, challenges, opportunities. We call it the living and breathing classroom. Um, and in a living and breathing classroom, we can't dictate what's going to be there when we show up the next morning. Um, we can't control the weather. There's so much we can't control. Um, and when an educator moves uh, outside of the four classrooms, when we, when we go outside, inherently we have to trust that we'll be able to um, navigate that, the unknown um, and, and, and use that for, for children, for their learning. Um, one educator we worked with in Calgary a couple of years ago said, what I love most about teaching outdoors is that nature becomes the momentum and I don't have to be or the bulletin boards in the classroom aren't um, the markers of learning. The natural world becomes that. Uh, a few years ago, I can't remember if uh, 
Emery or Emmett was there. One day we showed up late fall on site and there were eagles flying overhead, which doesn't happen every day. It happens in Vancouver. The forest schools in Vancouver see eagles all the time, but not in Ottawa. Um, so there were eagles flying overhead and all the children and all the educators were like, why are the eagles here? Why, why did they come? Why are they circling over there? Um, so it took about two hours for all the children to show up and, um, and, and for them to decide that they, act, they wanted to go see why the eagles were flying overhead. So they walked over, they were a little trepidatious. What's going on? The eagles, you know, what, what kind of omen is this? What, you know, is there garbage? Um, and then um, they ended up finding a, a dead deer that had been attacked absolutely the night before um, by a coyote and a couple of weeks prior to that they had seen uh, coyote tracks on site so you know there were markers leading up to that event um, and then they found the dead deer and they held a funeral for the dead deer and that then led to an inquiry about death um, which is not something we talk a lot about with children um, but they really want to talk about it um, and it ended up, you know, we ended up making art um, partially through the funeral and through other things that came out of it, but it, it ended up being a beautiful, beautiful day. Um, so trusting the unknown, trusting that we'll be able to handle that, trusting that children are competent and capable and curious um, is, is a big part of, of what we do. Um, and managing and balancing risk is also a big part of what we do. Um, as an organization, we work nationally. Um, and some of our biggest work, we have a, a major project happening right now, is on uh, risk and supporting risk, um, supporting children's right to play, but also their right to engage with risk. And when I say risk, I mean to hold a stick. Most children in their environments, in all of their environments, at home, um, at school, take a minute the next time you visit a park or pass a park and listen to what, what is being uh, said to children. And it's often, don't touch that, put the stick down, you're not allowed to climb in the rock, you know, as, as I had mentioned before. So, so risk and trust is a, is a big piece. The last thing I'm going to share is about sharing power. Um, and, and this kind of touches on the last theme, these are all connected, sharing, sharing power and embracing the unknown. Um, so again, we view children as competent and capable. capable. Um, and when children are leading their own learning process, what has to happen is we have to actually hand over some of our power. We have to take a few steps back and hand over, over power and trust that they will be able to navigate um, they will be able to lead their play, that they'll be able to navigate the unknown, they'll be able to brainstorm with their friends um, what to do with that. Uh, a few years ago, we had an older group um, from the Ottawa Carleton District School Board on our site, and when they showed up, there was, uh, a, th this was a grade six class, which is the oldest kind of age that we work with. Um, when they showed up, there was this a uh, young boy in the class, he was a little bit larger, he was wearing a leather jacket and was like, you know, like walked into forest school, like he was owning it. Um, but we noticed he didn't really have any friends. He, um, no one was like, he, he didn't have a buddy in his class. He was kind of by himself for most of uh, the first part of the day. And they ended up going out to Rocky and Mossy Place. This is not the child with the leather jacket, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but we ended up going out to Rocky and Mossy Place. This is Rocky and Mossy Place. And when we got out there, at, at a certain point, this child, this, this bigger child with a leather jacket, uh, started moving big sticks, like big trunks, big sticks, big rocks, uh, and started building something. And slowly, all of the children in his class were like, like looking at him like, what's he, what's he building? What's he moving? Like, uh, he can build really like heavy sticks, like he can move things. And they realized that he could move things that other children couldn't. Um, and all of a sudden, this kid became the star of the class, like star of the class. Um, and uh, what ended up happening, um, the educators, you know, stood back. We didn't, at the beginning, you know, force children to play with each other. We didn't force anyone to include this child. Um, we just stepped back. 
And slowly, the other children discovered that he brought so much value to the table and, and had so many gifts to offer. And he became the cool, by the end of the day, everyone was like patting him on the back, high fives. Like, um, and, and it was really beautiful and, it, and an example of what happens when we step back um, and we share power and we allow children to kind of navigate some of these things. And that's not to say that we don't ever have to step in. Um, because, uh, you know, freedom and sharing power, we still have a role to play as, um, as adults who are caring for children, um, but it's about being mindful of, of those things. I'm going to look for, at Marwan for, oh, awesome, great. Um, so maybe I'll end uh, this talk. Uh, here's a few more pictures. I could have been going through these photos uh, while I was speaking. I clearly can't do two things at one time. Um, <laughs> Yeah, and maybe I'll, I'll end the chat with, uh, you know, I, I've shared some stories and some lessons and, and things that I have seen um, through this work. And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, rather than say, this is what you can do in your life to bring wonder, I'm going to share uh, what I have learned and what I'm trying to incorporate into my day-to-day uh, -day life. And, and, and this work, I think, wonder and also a relationship with the land and a relationship with nature and being playful, um, it's a practice. It's not, you know, it's not something we do. Um, once and then you know check that box um, it, it's a practice and so for me um, how I've applied some of these teachings this is Daisy I love Daisy um, so how I have uh, applied this um, and this is something Lee, Lee Rose and I talked about a couple of weeks ago when we were on Wasson Island um, I am trying on a regular basis to leave more room in my schedule who finds that difficult? <laughs> Anyone else? Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, but I find when I leave like one day with no meetings or you know large chunks of time to think and to breathe or to go for a walk or to sit on the canal, it's not major things. I'm not like a you know a backpack. Yeah, I, I'm not doing like a Algonquin Park every weekend. So I I, I want to like to spell that myth. Um, but for me, it's like little little practices of um, last night. My partner Tanya and I, we sat on the back deck uh, in the thunder and lightning storm. Um, and it was, it was just about like slowing down and like sitting, um, sitting with that and being with that. And, uh, and I'm trying to make a lot more space and time in my own life for that um, and for my children. Um, going outside or often, I've kind of touched on this, um, nature is a teacher <laughs> and I think because our lives are so indoor based and because we're so used to being inside um, we forget that there's this like beautiful uh, natural world and and we talk about a nature continuum for me nature is found um, on the canal behind Parliament has anyone um, has anyone biked or run or walked behind Parliament and there's one spot that smells so sweet in the summer does anyone notice that? Next time you're behind Parliament Building, just like walk very slowly and you'll notice that there's some, I don't know what plant it is, but it's so sweet. Um, so just doing that often. Um, my instinct, my instinct, and I do this work, my instinct is to stay inside when it's cold and to stay inside when it's raining um, or, you know, or, or any of those things. Um, and so I have to be really mindful that like that's an instinct, that's a, a, an evolutionary instinct to survive. <laughs> so we're not in control of it. Um, but we can like play with that and work with it. And um, I'm always extremely rewarded when I go for a run. Um, in the rain or um or go for a hike even in uh, at the forest school in the like the the kids are playing in minus 40 and i'm like i could do it too um so uh that's that's something i work on um if you have children um or if you know children have a conversation uh, a conversation with with the parents um allow the walk to the park to be longer than the time at the park you might have wanted to go to the park, but if your child is like turning over rocks or wants to smell every tree and every plant, let them. You don't even have to get to the park. In fact, don't go to the park. <laughs> you know, and that can feel, I, I, see, I see it in myself, I see it in other parents. Like, we're, we, we have somewhere to go. We have to go to the park. You don't have to go to the park. You might have a plan, but let go of that plan when your child um, has, you know, something else in mind. Um, and maybe the last thing, um, 
two things, under-program, under-program yourself, under-program your children's lives, and, and language matters. So language and conversation matters. Having conversations about risk, having conversations about trust, about space, time, wonder, they're worthwhile conversations to have. Um, and I would say language with children, one of the things we have seen in our work, how we speak with children, how we talk, um, you know, I notice, I see, this reminds me of, um, that language is really important at planting seeds of curiosity and, and seeds of wonder. There's another picture of me. Um, <laughs> I'll, yeah, I'll end there. Thank you. <laughs> put a fire in my belly <laughs> like let's talk <laughs> this could be a whole other talk can you hear me okay um, so uh, believe it or not in this uh, this doesn't feel like it's working but uh, believe it or not in Canada um, <clears throat> the majority of like legislation and regulation that regulates like childhood is, is regulated um, and the majority of the regulations have to do with buildings building codes, how many windows are inside the building. Um, and we have some major work to do in advocating for children's right to play and advocating for children's right to have access to the land. Um, it is, we have been supporting this movement. We work with educators and early childhood educators um, across Canada. <clears throat> in the Northwest Territories, to Newfoundland, to BC. We're in almost, uh, we have staff in almost every province and partners in almost every province. <clears throat> and at this point, we, uh, there are now, uh, in the last 10 years, there are now over 400 forest and nature schools, which we're really excited about and really proud of. Um, and we have a lot of work to do. Those educators who are trying to support this culture of play and that connection to the land um, are swimming like major um, uphill battles. Most of them are not allowed to run like full-time programs, um, even if they have cabins and really beautiful spaces. Um, so as a result, uh, they're mostly part-time programs and, and that impacts access and equity. It creates a lot of barriers for families that can't afford to take their child to that program one day a week. Um, and it creates a lot of barriers for us in, in you know, creating more experiences like this for children. Um, so we're working, you know, even last week I got two emails from the Ontario and New Brunswick Legislative Assembly um, and the researchers with the Legislative Assemblies um, who are starting to do research on this work to help break down those barriers and, and, and improve access and equity. Um, but I think uh, we have a lot of work to do in the next five years to, to help that. Um, we have uh, mostly, um, we are prioritizing working with educators within uh, public education. So uh, maybe the one thing that I haven't said yet is th there's nothing alternative about this. 
Uh, we've had people say, like, this is alternative school. Um, and I'm like, no, it's not. This is very normal. This, there's nothing alternative. Every child should have access and a right um, to forest and nature school and play um, and access to the land. In fact, um, uh, removing um, you know, cultures and peoples and children's access to the land is like a very deliberate act of oppression and, and genocide in Canada. That displacement um, has been very deliberate. So um, I think for me, when, when I first talk about this work, it's like play, it's so nice. And I'm like, play, it's so vital. It's so important for child development, but it's also so important for culture and how we experience culture, how we experience place. Um, and, and so I have a fire in my belly and, um, and, and we have different strategies that we, um, that we have uh, to help break down some of those barriers. Um, our work with Ottawa Carleton District School Board, the work JoJo was doing last year with Ottawa Community Housing, um, are two really good examples of how we're um, helping to support that. Did that answer? That was like a really roundabout way with, you know, me saying fire in my belly like four times. But yes. Hi. Um, I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old, and one of the first things I noticed when I had a kid and I was making a group for myself of other parents was how those groups tended to harbor this like anxiety world, and it just reinforced itself. And I had to work really hard to find groups of people who were not doing that. So I follow a group called Let Grow, which mm. is like this anti-helicopter parenting. Mm. You talked a lot about how you work with kids, and I wonder if you've also observed this anxiety that I see and this bombardment of news stories that tell you all the most dangerous things and ban all this stuff, and how you counter that, or if you counter that with parents, or are you mostly working with parents who are already in your mindset? Yeah, we, we have several campaigns right now that we're working on um, to like work with caregivers, and absolutely, like that was my experience when I uh, first became a parent 12 years ago, <laughs> um, and, and then again when Emery was born nine years ago. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, so the, the two campaigns, um, our partner at UBC and, and BC Injury Prevention, um, Mariana, Dr. Mariana Bersoni, launched a website called outsideplay.ca, and we've been working with her on a risk reframing tool, which sounds really complicated, but it's basically um, a website to help parents uh, think about how they're responding to uh, risk and anxiety about, about their child outdoors and, and engaging in outdoor play. Um, we're also working on a national risk benefit assessment toolkit and in 2015, um, we, we worked on uh, a position statement on active outdoor play that was disseminated through uh, the, what is it called, the participation report card. Um, and the theme of that position statement was loosen the reins on childhood. And we're still seeing lots of great dialogue and impact from that. Um, you know, the thing, maybe one thing that I'll, I'll say around that anxiety, it's very normal when you become a new parent to feel anxious. Like, again, we have this evolutionary um, instinct and drive to protect our child, um, and that is fueled by, you know, uh, media and lots of other things. Um, it's just, how, how do we work with that? You know, it's very normal to have fears, and then we have to push beyond those fears to, to, give, uh, to give children that freedom. So I don't know if I answered your question. I, I agree with you, yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, the Ottawa Forest and Nature School, we work with about 5,000 children and families a year, and we've worked with children with all kinds of uh, different needs and exceptionalities, um, and it's been really beautiful to see, A, what they bring, <laughs> you know, to the forest and to, to programs, and then also to see what Forest and Nature School offers, uh, offers them. Um, the, through our network over the last six years, we've worked with 
now close to 1,500 educators and early childhood educators who work with very different uh, groups of children and in very different settings and schools. And tons of the educators we've worked with have gone through our training and are now like doing amazing work. Um, we're trying to tell those stories a little bit more. We've started um, on our blog doing um, like uh, snapshots of programs across Canada and I'd have to go back to see if we're, uh, if, if we have any really good stories and examples, but uh, check that out because there, there's really great work happening. Yeah. Great. Thank you very much.